Okay, I think we're at about 5 o'clock. So we're going to start. Jason is in the back. He's live streaming for us. So we have that. I do want to welcome everybody here this afternoon. I know it's Valentine's Day weekend. and, and Did you forget Calvin? Oh. Take a pie when you go. Maybe that'll get you out of the doghouse. No. <laughs> so, but thank you. It's cold out. Um, the one good thing, it's been a pretty good winter, folks. And so we'll make it through this. So, I am Steve McClary. I'm the former representative for this district. I don't know if there's too many here that probably do not know me. And today, I do want to see. I want to welcome everybody. Those uh, I do want to say this is being sponsored by the Sisseton Area Chamber of Commerce. So they are picking up the pie and the coffee. And the legislators uh, from this district, I guess I'll go that way. Uh, Senator Michael Roll is come right outside of Aberdeen. He was not able to make it here today. Tamara St. John, who has the COVID, so she will not be here today. But we do have Representative Jennifer Kintz from Eden. So. And I do want to, it's got listed, I've got paperwork here to go by, go through. It says acknowledge past legislators. So David Gleason, wave your hand. We have one there. Senator Gary Hansen over there. Myself and I think that's it that I can remember. Okay. All right, so other than that, housekeeping rules. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give Jennifer four or five minutes to explain who she is, where she's from, what committee she is on, and anything of that nature. We won't get into the bills until we get that done. I'm going to allow 15 minutes kind of for each issue because I'll guarantee you there's going to be some issues that we can talk for 45 minutes on and I don't want to take anything away from something else. That's kind of the way I've done these in the last six years. But we will come back to those. That way we can get a full circle of everything. So with that, I'm going to let Jennifer go ahead and start. And then certainly one, if we get one topic or subject on a certain bill, we're going to do question and answers. And if not, I mean, we have a county commissioner here, Dennis Jensen. So we got a little bit of the county side of it too. So other than that, uh, Thank you. Okay, I am going to take my mask off to see if maybe my speaking can be a little more clear this way. This is my third Cracker Barrel of the day. Started off in Aberdeen where I was with two Aberdeen legislators and then next we were in Britain. I was with Senator Roll there and now I'm just on my own here. So I've gone from three to one. I, I guess I'm the, I'm the last one doing this, but actually it's worked out really well because you kind of get on a roll with uh, certain topics. So thank you all for being here. And I'm really grateful to Steve for coordinating this as I, I know most of you and most of you probably know that He's the one that got me involved with this and running for the state legislature. So I really appreciate that. And he's been a great friend and mentor to me and uh, haven't seen him in a while. So I'm glad to do that. And I'm glad to see all of you here. So I've been in the legislature for five weeks and boy, has it been an interesting experience. And those of you who have been there, who have followed, know uh, what I'm talking about. There are definitely some good things that happen in peer and some disappointing things that are happening in peer. So I, obviously I can't touch on everything. I'm going to give you a couple highlights and then I'm sure you all have questions and things that you'd like to talk about. Uh, you know, we're seeing some of the same types of bills come from uh, other districts, other specific legislators in other districts that are some of the more controversial things that are brought year after year uh, on some social issues, some divisive social issues. I'm on the Health and Human Services Committee, so a lot of them are coming through there. Some of them are coming through education, which I'm also on. And with our small numbers, we have eight Democrats in the House and three Democrats in the Senate 
the lowest number, I think, since the 1950s. And so that means that most of the committees only have one Democrat. Education and Health and Human Services have two. So I am with Representative Aaron Healy from Sioux Falls on both of those committees. That's been really helpful for me as a new legislator to have somebody who's who's been there before on those committees. And we are seeing a lot of some more controversial things come through there. Uh, obviously, marijuana has been a big issue. I'm sure that you've heard in the last couple weeks, uh, this last week with Amendment A being um, found unconstitutional by the circuit court and then waiting for hopefully that to go to the state Supreme Court and then not coincidentally in my opinion the same day that that was announced it was announced that medical marijuana in initiated measure 26 would have to be delayed another year and uh, that's one that I'm particularly frustrated about because it seems like nothing was done until that day when they said, oh, we, well, we've hired a consulting firm and now it's gonna take us, a, a, we need an extra year. And, you know, that's really kind of hard to believe because the election happened three months ago, over three months ago, and they knew it was on the ballot for months before that. So I, I just think we've got to respect the process and the will of the voters that that voted for these measures and we've got to implement them. And, and so I think this is, these delaying tactics are, are really frustrating. And I know that there are people on both sides of the aisle pushing for us to not delay this, but at the same time, one of the things I've really seen in the last five weeks in the legislature is there are very few that are willing to stand up to the governor. It's kind of what she says goes Another great example of that is the merger of Department of Ag and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. That's been really frustrating. I was expecting at least a uh, resolution to say we oppose this. They couldn't even, you know, get the bravery to uh, oppose that in a resolution. So it looks like it's going forward. Nobody's willing to really speak out about it in uh, big enough numbers to make a difference. So that's, I think that's really disappointing. Uh, somebody at an earlier Cracker Barrel asked me, you know, what's wrong with combining those departments? And, you know, I don't know that it's a right or wrong issue. It's just kind of an interesting change in priorities because agriculture obviously is our number one industry and tourism is our number two industry. And our tourism industry relies on our environment and natural resources as as what is the foundation for our tourism. So it's really frustrating that if these are the two biggest priorities in our state, that we would put them into one department and remove positions from that when those departments are already probably understaffed, underfunded, and we're even minimizing that even more. So I've, I found that really frustrating and I know that other people do too who are also from rural districts, but they're just not saying so. And I would say that's probably one of the bigger frustrations that I'm experiencing in Pierre. But there have also been a lot of good things that have happened. And I don't know if any of you caught this this last week, but there was this beautiful moment of bipartisan support of a wonderful, wonderful bill. You may be aware of this. Um, in 1939, a law went on the books that people who were blind or visually impaired could attend our Board of Regents universities for free up to 225 credits, I believe is the number, and that's, that's well beyond a bachelor's degree that could potentially be all the way through a PhD. So this has been on the books for all those years. Of course, technology has changed our university system, especially recently, but this statute did not explicitly cover online classes. So the, there was a bill introduced by Representative Healy from Sioux Falls that would have would add uh, online classes to these options. And there were some people, we heard some great testimony in education committee from a few folks around the state who especially want to take online classes because they're working full time. They, uh, one gentleman, I believe from Brookings, 
is working full time and then he was paying full tuition for his online classes despite being he's had a degenerative condition so he's losing his sight so anyway it was just incredible to me it passed unanimously through education committee and there are a couple of usual suspects in that committee that kind of vote against everything so that was surprising and then we got to the house floor and all 70 members of the house voted for it it was i'm telling you this is unusual unusual there have been other things that you would think everybody would vote for and there's still a few that drop off and don't vote for it so i i just found that to be a really encouraging moment that we can do something right for people and guess what it costs money and people still supported it because it's the right thing to do so that, that was like i said that was probably my highlight um so far was that moment and that was just this last week but it has been in general a very positive experience good experience obviously frustrating moments but it's you know there's a there's a lot to do a lot to learn a lot of great people there uh and also a lot of challenges so that's a little bit of a recap anything you want to go into some questions or do you have some Yeah, so that actually uh, did not make it through the Senate, but this is this was a Senate bill that would have allowed the uh, formation of Osheti Shikowin Community Schools, and they would have been three or four schools, Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Rapid City, not in our area, at least initially, uh, but these would be cult uh, teaching in a culturally relevant way not just subject matter but also the way that things would be taught um, I guess it went through last year and then it didn't go anywhere it, it in the house I believe last year yeah and this year it was a lot different and you know a lot of and I actually noticed that um, one of the daily newspapers had quoted me as saying that I supported charter schools when we were talking about that at the Aberdeen Cracker Barrel a couple weeks ago. And I do see this as different than charter schools. And I've spoken with some of the school administrators and I know that, uh, and, and the South Dakota Education Association and, uh, you know, have been opposed to it because they're worried about charter schools. I just thought that this was such a, uh, such an important initiative to and it's driven by Native Americans for the benefit of Native American students and that's what I thought was really important um, so it didn't go past the Senate Leanne was there <laughs> uh, and that was a really disappointing moment for me and for a lot of people uh, hoping that we'll bring this back again because I do think it's really important to address that uh, a lot of our some of my colleagues in the House and Senate talked about how, um, you know, they're looking at 50% dropout rates in some schools. Specifically, I think the reference was um, to some Rosebud schools that, you know, with 50% dropout. And we got, we've got to help stop that. And, you know, so I, I just was really disappointed that, that it didn't go anywhere. Um, and hopefully, you know, next year we can bring something back and give it another try. Mm. No, it just, it was an idea to do something new and last year it did pass unanimously through the Senate but it failed in the House Education Committee last time this time it actually didn't make it out of the Senate you know, despite two two days of, of voting on it it just uh, you know so it's sometimes somebody told me and I, I am trying to take this to heart that sometimes you have these great ideas but it might take a few years to get them pass through we learn as we learn as democrats you plant to see it's not always going to go the first year sometimes the next year the other party picks it up 
and they'll go with it. We just don't have enough for them. So that's kind of what I have. Uh, a couple things on that, on the same education for Native Americans. I think five years ago when I was on education committee, we had, thank you, we had a bill there too that would revise some of the grade points and, and different classes that would be able to be put in instead of taking your major courses. That was a bill that we had, I think, five years ago. Three years ago, we reduced the graduation, I think if I remember right, the level. So we brought that down so we could get away from 50% dropout so we could get more, more kids in Native American schools and in, in the districts and reservations that would be able to graduate and move on. Otherwise, they get disappointed, they get disgusted, and they just, and it's gone. And that's unfortunate. Thank you. Yeah, Trish. What was the objection to that bill with the schools? Um, so the main objection that I heard is there was concern about this opening the door for charter schools. And that's why I said I don't support charter schools. And I believe that this is something different. You know, I think we've had a variety of alternative things happen around the state. One of them that has, has stood out to me, and it's not exactly the same, but we send our public school teachers to some of the Hutterite colonies to teach them, and that's never opened the door to publicly funded charter schools. So it's, uh, that was the main objection, and the, you know, the major education associations, school boards, I mean, they were all opposed to this, and I heard from a lot of school administrators throughout the district that were opposed to it also. But once again, I, I was a supporter of it. It didn't come before me for a vote, but I've always been publicly in favor of it, and I'm, I am hoping that it'll come back again. But these are tribal schools, correct? Well, so they would be, uh, so th this would be a community school, so it wouldn't be like a, a BIE school, like TZ, or you know, this would be something different. And once again, this is not something that was planned for our area at all. And I don't know if, I mean, it would probably be something, you know, farther down the road just because we've got existing schools here. But it's something that's worked in other states that's been really successful. And so some, um, you know, Senator Heinert wanted to bring that to South Dakota and it. It, unfortunately, it just it hasn't gone anywhere yet. But I, I do think that it'll it'll be it's a long term plan. In my conversations with the SDEA um, president, I think he is. Uh, he said that they are in favor of something. So that that sounds like it's a step. Right, it's not, we're totally opposed to this, but what that's gonna be, but my, my belief also is that this though should be driven by Native American education leaders in our state and not by the SDEA. So how that happens, I, I'm not sure. So it would be public funding, just like a public school. And so that's where, that's where some people were concerned about it. Uh, but the thing, you know, one of the greatest points that I heard on that from Senator Heiner is if you've got a 50% dropout rate and half those kids are dropping out, you're not getting their money either. So if you're keeping kids in school, you're keeping money in your district. Um, did anybody else watch uh, South Dakota Public TV Thursday night on Focus? I think there it's being integrated into the Rapid City School District. If I'm not mistaken, they have the superintendent there, and they are trying to do a, a course there where they're going to try and implement it there anyway. So, like a magnet program, yes. Don't, don't let's let's scratch the charter word. Let's let's not go there. Okay, this is a magnet. It's something new. But there again, I mean, if if you ever want to kind of catch up, other than 12 o'clock at night, where <laughs> where we got state house now instead of in the afternoon, uh, Thursday night, I think it's at eight o'clock. That's, that's kind of when you catch up on, on what's going on. So, okay. And um, magnet schools work in a larger district like a Rapid City or Sioux Falls. It would be difficult to do that in a rural area because, in theory, you're offering, you know, one of multiple options. So we'll see where that one goes. I do think it's, it's important, and I think it's going to happen. It's just going to be a matter of time.
I am. Oh, yeah, any other questions? Can you say more about education? I'm curious what's happening with the different roles of opposition for $900,000 for the state and the student school. I teach teaching, so I teach as a part teacher, I incorporate world history and world history, and I teach the classes, and I teach the world history, and I teach the Yeah, and we haven't, right, civics, and, and this, it kind of gave the impression that we're not teaching civics in our school, or we're not teaching history. Um, I think there are some people behind this that if you paid attention to a certain resolution that came out this last week about Black History Month that attempted to rewrite the history of our country in a way that made slavery seem like it was an okay thing and it was about 14 pages long I think some of that is what's behind this like making sure that the realities of history are not brought to light that this you know, there's, to continue a whitewashing of history in the education committee we have not seen any specific bills the Department of Education has given a presentation about what they would intend to do. They would offer curriculum resources for schools, but it didn't sound to me like they were intending anything, first of all, that would be required. It would be something that's resources that schools could use if they would choose to, but they would not have to, and that it sounded like it was very much in line with what's already happening. Now, that'll remain to be seen from the schools, but not, they said that nothing would be required, that they would just have resources available to supplement what's already being taught. So, I'm going to follow up on that. Well, that's nice, but so they get to just spend the $900,000 on optional materials about taxpayer money. Well, I think that's a well, it hasn't been appropriated yet, to my knowledge. So, we'll see what happens in appropriations. <laughs> right, well, yes. <laughs> but we'll see if that happens. Obviously, there are a lot of other things being brought forward and proposed for spending money that have not been, it hasn't been decided one way or another. But yes, that's, that is not, uh, there are a lot of other things we could spend that money on besides something that's already in place. Good question, thank you. Oh, oh Gary. Adult learning? I like that idea. <laughs> right. Uh, The uh, the victors write the history. Is that something something to that effect? Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> um, Steve mentioned health. So I'm also on health and human services. We have seen we're seeing a variety of things come through there. We've had a couple different bills that have brought in a lot of people to testify who are opposed to vaccines. There is nothing in any of the proposals or in any existing statute that requires anyone to get a vaccine. Vaccines are not required. Uh, vaccines are not going to be mandated. Um, but there's a lot of fear that they are or that they will be among a small group of people. I would say I don't think this is widespread. We've actually had the same people coming back and, you know, saying that they believe their children were harmed by vaccines without any medical um, evidence to back that up. My, um, from my perspective, um, so that's, that's taken up quite a bit of time in Health and Human Services with a couple different bills coming that way. Uh, we have had you know, an anti-transgender bill that came up a while ago that failed in the committee and they did the good old smoke out maneuver that was my first week or second week of 
So that was interesting. And then it did pass in the House. It's still uh, waiting to be heard in the Senate. So we'll see what happens there. But I know there's another one coming about, um, allow this. that one was about birth certificates, whether you know, people should be allowed to have male or female, change male or female in their birth certificate, which, by the way, if you didn't know, they already can get that changed through the courts. So there is an existing process, and only about an average of three people per year have had that change made. But they wanted to disallow that process. We'll see where that goes. Uh, another one is coming up related to uh, a transgender young person being able to participate in sports. And that one, I think, is maybe going to be even a little more controversial because some people who have been okay with the birth certificates, for example, are not okay with a transgender child participating in sports. My view on that, I'll be happy to share with you, is uh, I have no problem with that. I think that transgender people should be allowed to live and be who they they are on the, um, on the inside, who they believe they are, and I don't have an issue with that. I don't, I don't think our sports, I don't think girls' sports are going to be overrun with boys, quote-unquote, pretending to be girls so they can play girls' sports. That just seems a little unrealistic to me. So that's my view on that. A lot of times they tend to start these bills in, in really conservative states. Same thing as in North Dakota. They're going, they're going, they got the same thing up there. Exact same thing, different bill number. But that's in transgender stuff. They like to concentrate on conservative states try to get that kind of pulled through. Uh, those three bills, did you have anything on those on the computer? you want to discuss those at all for health care? Eleven thirty-nine is that the first one? Let's see, we got about five hundred bills, which is a lot of bills. <laughs> okay, so actually, this one is authorized visitation of hospital patients and other healthcare facility residents. And this one was supposed to be heard this last week in Health and Human Services, but it's been delayed. And it it would require healthcare facilities to allow a, a, a person to visit. You know, this is surrounding COVID. I guess I have some concerns about that. I really don't think the state should be mandating that. I think our healthcare facilities are all different and should be making those decisions as it works for them. Some of our, you know, especially some of our nursing homes are very small and to provide for a, a place, you know, and I know a lot of them are already doing really good work as far as that goes. I'm on a board of the Roslyn Nursing Home and I know that they have been really good with people who have ability to FaceTime and things like that. They'll help them do that and then they also set up a, kind of an entryway area where people could visit on either side and you know I think if we can give resources if there are financial needs that they have to be able to do these things then we should be letting them figure out what works best for their facilities. And a little bit to add to that, being I'm on the hospital board and nursing home board here, what you could end up with is you could have a doctor, you might have a patient in the hospital, and they might want to see their family. Well, if you have a, let's say, a sensitive doctor that says, yeah, I want to let so-and-so in to see mom or dad or a sister or brother. Well, if you go back two months when COVID was really, really bad, we don't want that in our facility. Okay, that's the protection. This gives our hospital board the administrator to say, no, we're not doing that. Otherwise, you got one doctor that will, one doctor that won't. Same way with the nursing home. You have to draw the line somewhere, I'm sorry, because we haven't been through a pandemic before like we have now. That saves lives. At some point, that patient will be out of the hospital but to keep that away from the staff and other people, this is this is a bill that we do not want. So you so you kind of know from from a board person side what's happening. Okay, thank you. 
and there's another one, 1154, which would uh, prohibit employment contracts restricting competitive health care practices. So I'm just taking a look at this. Uh, that it, This one hasn't been in committee yet either, so I haven't looked into this one uh, too much. Yeah, yeah, possibly, but it's, you know, and one thing I've learned, um, it doesn't take very long to learn that certain people, certain representatives or senators introduce certain bills, and you can kind of tell that if it's introduced by a certain person, wouldn't you agree, that it's, uh, you look at it with a certain eye of skepticism because they have a, a consistent pattern of introducing things that are, generally, in my view, not beneficial for our, for, not that it couldn't happen, but it doesn't happen that long, that often. What's the other one, 1159? I think we actually did see this one already. Yes, prohibit interference with the right to bodily integrity and contagious disease control is what it says. This was another um, anti-vax bill. So most of the people that testified over the course of an hour and a half were opposed to vaccines, um, which is not really what it does, but they, any, that's what they are, are seeing it as. And so they wanted to prohibit, for example, healthcare facilities from requiring that employees get a certain vaccine. Well, we know that a lot of our healthcare facilities require a flu shot. If you want to work for Avera, you need to get a flu shot. Employers have a right to do that. You can't say you can let somebody come in who does not have respect or regard for health and work in your uh, facility. If you don't want to get that shot, there are medical um, or religious exemptions that people can get. Um, my understanding is if you choose not to get a flu shot, then you wear a mask all the way through flu season. I'm assuming similar things are going to be in place with a COVID vaccine or maybe even more restrictive. These are healthcare organizations that believe in science, believe in health. If you don't want to comply with that, then work somewhere else, I guess, is you know what was determined there. And it did get deferred to the 41st day, so it's done. Um, and actually it was... Nine to three, which was actually a little bit surprising in a good way. Right. Uh, um, in some cases, yes. Uh, we did have some people uh, wanting, this was on a different bill, but wanting to remove the, the requirement for vaccinations for any reason. Because, so that they could go to school. But yes, that's the alternative. And I know when the Department of Health testified on a previous bill, they said nobody is required to get these vaccinations, but if you want to go to school, you have to get these vaccinations. So if you want to send your children to school. So then ho homeschooling is an option if they choose not to, or if they want to get a certain religions will allow an exemption or uh, certain medical type of situations. Mm -hmm. Right. Any, uh, any questions? Pardon me? I, I'm not sure, actually. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the view is on that, but that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, medical marijuana, you mentioned, Steve mentioned that a little bit earlier, how it has been deferred another year, or that's the proposal. There is a bill that will be coming through the House. I don't know if that'll be the uh, Health and Human Services or maybe more likely State Affairs to, to deter that, defer that for another year. I don't see any reason why we would need to defer another year other than just lack of preparedness on purpose, wanting it to not happen. Um, it's other 
other um, states are doing this in a short amount of time, I think we can do it too. And I don't mean to take time away from Jennifer, but we've been on this for five years. I was in the house for six years. We've been dealing with this for five years. And it's really a lot of BS, I'm sorry. You've got children that have seizures. And the, I know the one family in Sioux Falls that I'm relating to, that little boy had anywhere from 50 to 100 seizures per day sometimes. They get their medicine from Colorado. If we could just have that, when they have that, it reduces it down to one, two, or three per day. And I testified on the floor twice on this. It's just, it's a matter of, I don't know if it's a party thing or if it's an ultra-conservative thing, but there's no vision to have, to let those individuals have a family life, to have a common sense family life like you and I do. It is really ridiculous. So hopefully, and I did text, I think all the Democrats the other day, and I said, see if you can't come up with a, another bill or a resolution or something to split that out. So if you want a recreational, take that and delay that another year, but let's go with the medical. Let's get that done. That's not hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to have all this freedom unless it's something that certain people don't want us to have freedom. Or, I'm not sure, but I just really think respecting the, the will of the voters is incredibly important. That's Isn't that really the foundation of our democracy is voting? And speaking, actually speaking of voting, there have been a few bills uh, through this session that are trying to make it harder to vote. Uh, we're trying to reduce the amount of time to vote early from 46 to 30 days. I believe that one did not go through. Uh, but there was another one, remember, and because of the pandemic, how we all received or should have received an absentee ballot application. Not an absentee ballot, but the application was sent to everyone, which I remember being pretty surprised that our state was doing that and really pleased. And um, a representative brought a bill that would make it so they could not automatically send those out to everyone, which I don't think they would do in a non-pandemic time. I, I'm anticipating if in 2022 we're not in a pandemic, they're not going to mail those to everyone. But they made it so, well, it hasn't made its way through the Senate yet, but if it does, then they wouldn't be able to automatically send that. You'd still be able to get it. But it was, it, there was some interesting testimony on that or spe people speaking on that, um, quoting the governor's previous words, talking about how good and effective our voting process is here, but yet there are all these bills coming to change our voting process. So how can it be so great if we also need to make these changes? So that's, that's concerning to me. I think we should be making it easier to vote, not harder. You may have also heard uh, this one happened over in the Senate, so I wasn't involved with it, but the uh, online voter registration, which the Secretary of State's office wanted people to be able to register online, and that one didn't make it either. So it's, you can print off a form and mail it in, but I, I have a real estate business. I know for a fact that a lot of people don't have printers. You know, it's just, it's just something that a lot of people don't need. If you don't need a printer, you don't have a printer. And so making it, um, it's just making, keeping things as hard as, as possible from people or people being able to vote. It's my view. Uh, is it going to affect hemp? So actually I'm looking at some of this language in this new bill and I don't I, I have heard that it's going to affect hemp but I don't know the exact I have not heard the the exact 
way that it would do that, but I think there's a lot of concern about that because that was a, a long, hard battle to get industrial hemp legalized here in the state too. So, and if you watch TV or any even newspapers, you'll see Representative Orrin Lesmeister from Eagle Butte. He was the sponsor. I was a co-sponsor of that. I'm kind of glad I didn't sponsor that, to be honest with you. He was all over the country. Uh, I think it took a lot of time. We're prepared to go forward with, with hemp, without a doubt. We have testing equipment, because one of the fears they had, to, you know, this is the third year now that we've dealt with that. We have testing equipment the size of Gen even smaller than Jennifer's laptop or iPad that you can test a semi-load. If you've got a semi-load of hemp being transported across the state and it gets stopped, you can have a testing device. You can test that so you can see that is what it is and the numbers are down, the percentages are down. There's people waiting to grow this stuff. And yet, here we are. We're going to get that delayed another year and another year. And I'm going to relate it a little bit just for Jeremiah for the winery farm wineries, if we were to do this for your industry and say, no, no, we're not ready yet, no, we got to do this, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. We've got people that want to plant hundreds of acres of this stuff. And it does better. The farther west you go in the state, the better it does. It's very expensive to get into, but it, you know, and there again, it's another industry for the Native Americans. Flandreau has been waiting for this. They were prepared and ready to roll. No, can't do that. It's progress in a way for some people and for others. Just don't want progress in this unless it's what they see and what they want. Any other questions? Just thinking of right now. Or? That's a really uh, great point, and I believe it should be. I uh, believe there's a bill, it's not related specifically to the decks at Huron, but that would require using in state companies for things like marketing, advertising, that, that sort of thing. Um, I'd have to look up the bill. You know, and maybe that's a starting point. But I think that's a, you raise a really important point because we're always talking about how great our state is, how great the people are, and but yet when it comes to certain things, we're going outside the state to look for those. And have we given enough consideration to the people that, and companies that are already here? I really don't think that a South Dakota advertising agency would have come up with meth were on it. I really don't. And showing all those people in their different situations, you know, like a, an older farmer saying, I'm on meth. Or, you know, I just, it, it, it almost seemed like they knew they were making fun of us. That's just my, my personal view. And so, you know, we have a lot of talent in our state. And especially when it comes to building, uh, anything building, we've had a lot of great, facilities built around the state so to my knowledge there is not a requirement there I do hope that 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 happens but as I kind of mentioned earlier it seems like very very few are willing to stand up to the governor for anything she kind of just does what she wants and Example was, is if 
So I, in one of the earlier Cracker Barrels today, that that question came up, and another representative, senator, another legislator who was there said that they don't, that in that person's view, they don't want the information released because it's a lot less than you think it is, and that would put our governor at vulnerability and Steve's laughing and yes I, I think that's laughable there's no way that it's less than we think it is I, I think it's almost certain that it's more than we could even fathom and there is no accountability and I think you know that bill 1089 was brought by one of the more um, probably one would consider one of the most conservative right meaning representatives in the state so this it's not a partisan issue but as you all probably heard other republicans dropped off of that bill after being talked to by the governor and from what i understand that happens quite a lot people talk about being brought to the second floor i obviously I haven't been brought to the second floor she doesn't even know who i am but that, that does happen to a lot of people who and i think that it's not just a partisan situation i think though that a lot of people are easily swayed a, away from challenging the governor and they are maybe told that something else that they're interested in maybe we can further one of your other concerns if you leave this particular one alone and so with such a dramatic a dramatically uh you know, unbalanced legislature, that it's much easier to do that. If we were kind of uh, closer to a 50-50 or even 60-40, even not a 90-10, uh, I think there could be more ability for people to stand up for what's right and not just what their party tells them to do. So, yeah, I think your concerns are, you know, and these are the things I've been telling people, remember what is happening. Because it's so easy to forget. By the time the next election comes around, it's almost two years from now, it's very easy to forget that some of these things happen. And even next year at this time, when the legislature's in session, we're still a long way from an election. And unless you're part of it every day, you forget some of the things that are happening. So. And I'll add on to that. You know, when you're out there, you hear a lot of, it's the people's house. It's the people's legislature. That's as far as that goes. It, it is. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up one bill that's coming, 1115. Uh, I talked to a person on the Game Fish and Parks Commission this morning. Be aware of this because what we've just been talking about, the Game Fish and Parks Commission is a seven member board. It is written, the last 80 to 84 years, it is written there it's four people from one party and three from another, or if you want independence, this bill will do away with that. She has two positions to fill on that. One has been for seven months and she hasn't filled it. There's another one that's going to be expired and his term is out. She wants this bill passed so she can put whoever she wants and I'll guarantee you it'll be Republican. That's power, folks. It's no different, in my opinion, and if there's Republicans in here, I'm sorry. It's no different than the president we had a few months ago. You can't control or try to control what people do all the time. I told Bob this morning, if that's the case, then maybe it should all be Democrats on there because I know who comes with the good ideas. But they never get heard and they never progress. So that is one that I would ask you when that comes. Okay, it was already already seen. It. Yeah, it's it's coming, and that's terrible. 
it passed 45 to 22 out of the house this last week i voted against it that was an easy one you know the arguments that came from the other side on this is this should be nonpartisan. let's make this a totally a nonpartisan thing but there you know there's a split to make sure there's east river west river republicans democrats and actually it doesn't say it has to be republicans or democrats it says no more than four can be from one political party so if somebody could be a registered independent, registered no party affiliation. It's in those two spots, as Steve mentioned, that have been empty. What we've been told is that they've specifically said they will not fill those until this bill passes so they can fill them and fill them with who they want to fill them. And I think we have, if, if somebody said, let's, let's take out the split between East River and West River, both people both sides of the state would be opposed to that because we have different priorities, different needs. I'm sure there are a lot of Republicans and Democrats on that committee who see things the same, have the same views on things, but it just ensures that there's a broader support there. And so it was, it was a little, um, it was frustrating to hear people say, we want to change this because we want to make it nonpartisan, but yet it was so convenient that it's only done when there are two open spots that are supposed to be filled by Democrats. So I don't know, it's going to the Senate egg next, and so we'll see what happens there. Hope so. Yeah, let's hope so. I'm gonna back up just a little bit where the governor wants to put the two departments together, egg, natural resources, environment. I've been on that environment, natural resources for four years. That environment part, that takes care of city water, city lagoons, city sewer, and she wants to have this all in one. I, I don't really understand sometimes what she's trying to do. It's water projects, and those of us that farm in here, and there's a few of us, the, the worst thing we deal with is those that are in the environment to try and come and tell us what we can and can't do or shouldn't shouldn't do when you're farming. And I said, and I think this fall when we had a Women's League of Voters in Aberdeen, I, I did it by phone. That was the first question that was asked me. What do you think about this merger? No, I don't like it. I think I still think it's detrimental. How can you have one person that's going to control all of that? You're going to have a shift, I think, of, of different things. And, I, and of course, I'm, I'm fighting here for agriculture, but that that's a bad thing and I think I can relate back to game fish and parks you deal so much with ag land in that department that if you get too many sportsmen or whatever that could be on that that's just not going to be healthy David <laughs> Yeah, nobody looking over your shoulders. The I-29 corridor thing, that's where your dairies are. They just want to keep loading that up. Well, and if anybody knows of Kai Kathy Tyler, who is from here, she fought that down in the Millbank area because when you get so many big numbers like that of animals, pretty soon you run out of land to put the manure and the waste products, and pretty soon that goes to your water source. And I said two, three years ago, the best place, in my opinion, for that you get up here by Calvin because Calvin would love that. <laughs> but we've got areas up there where you can hold that and you can fertilize pastures and hay ground up there. And you're not going to have that get down to your water source because you go down the I-29 corridor and you get to Brookings, that water level is <laughs> pretty shallow, folks. So there's just a lot of a lot of issues here that we really need to be aware of. Thank you. I think we, hopefully we all can agree that farmers have it and always will be good stewards of the land because you've been there and you're going to continue to be there. Where corporate ag comes in, does their big feedlot, do they really care what they do to the land around it? If, if things become unmanageable, they'll just move on to the next city, the next state, wherever, they don't really care what kind of mess that they've left behind. And that's that's my real big concern about this merger too, is maybe, it, is I think that 
our local farmers are going to do fine with it. Um, it's really the big corporate egg that, and that's what she's trying to bring in too. Is is the big corporate egg? Yeah. So it, it'll eliminate a few positions and you know streamline some things. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremiah. Yeah. yeah. So I've I've researched this because I was I was curious about this. There are only two states that have these departments combined. One of them is Alaska, who has only a forty million dollar a year agricultural economy, which is teeny. That's nothing, and it's a huge state, obviously. So ag is is a department within their natural resources, kind of something like that. And then Rhode Island, which is smaller than a lot of our legislative districts. So. Uh, they and they actually they have a hundred and fifteen million dollar egg economy I think in a tiny state like that but it's it's small enough that they're able to manage it a little bit differently uh, with departments and otherwise no other state does it this way and so if egg and tourism are our top industries tourism being our 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 natural resources and our environment it doesn't make any sense to me that we would minimize both of those by combining them into one department there there has to be a a bigger issue at play other than saving a few hundred thousand dollars because if these are that important we would be spending uh, we'd be spending more i think these departments are already pretty underfunded the way that it, it goes. So. Yeah. So, right, so $125 million that they're working on for one-time money. We are trying to develop some ideas to at least to propose if anybody has I'm kind of taking some constituent ideas over the next couple of days. We're going to come up with some things. Oh, got something, yeah. And you know, and I think there are a lot of different possibilities uh, to use that money. It's it's one of those things that if you heard the governor say earlier last week and in the address that we have even more m money left over than anticipated. Well, it's coming kind of late in the process to let us know that that there is extra money um, available. It's not something that South Dakota is used to having. So I'm hoping that it will be spent in a way that will benefit many South Dakotans and not just a select few. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, I, I'm not aware of anything currently in the legislature about that. There, there are some things related to wind energy. So, and they keep, they kept saying over the last couple of weeks, Northeast South Dakota and wind energy. And like, your, your version of Northeast South Dakota is not the same as mine. But, you know, this is down by Clear Lake, Watertown, that area. And they've got a lot of extra money that there was a bill that came through the education committee that is allowing them to use that money from the, the wind towers to, uh, for example, go into their general fund. So if they wanted to do an addition on their school or something like that, as opposed to having to use that just um, like for, I mean, for teacher salaries is a great idea too, but to broaden their opportunities to use that money. And, you know, ideally if there are other, actually I think they changed it from wind energy to renewable energy, or maybe it was the other way around, but there has not, to my knowledge, been much happening with solar, but at what we do have wind, you know, in some other areas of the state. Yeah, you hit one of my favorite topics. <laughs> And we don't we don't have yet in this state where if if 
if I put our myself or David or Gary put in a quarter of solar power and you put it onto the line, we don't get a we don't get any money back yet. We, we don't have a bill that we can do that with yet, where we get uh, kilowatt hours is eleven cents or ten and three quarters. We get two or three cents back. We haven't passed anything like that, but solar is coming. We have a huge farm in Fall River, I believe it is. Um, my second year, I went to the school in public lands and I said, I want to bring a bill. Let's try and get solar farms on state land first, okay? On state land, provided you've got a three-phase line running on state land, you can put a solar farm there, hook it up to a three-phase line. You can use that money to general expenses, to education, to agriculture. We have a 500-acre solar farm going in out by Hot Springs. It's in it's in the southwest part of the state. Uh, Pier has one out by their airport. You can't see it because it's raised. There's one going in outside of Sioux Falls. It'll be 160 acres, and that will that power will go to Sioux Falls. So it's coming, but the rebate stuff a little tougher. Uh, but the per acre basis. For a, for a farm is huge. Yep. Yep. And they, and they did they did get me a map. They got me a map of state ground, and then they get, they brought me a map of where three phase lines go through. And and they're they're kind of still working on that. But he said, well, the issue we're going to have is if you've got a rancher that's hayland or pasture land, that they're going to be upset. Well, you're getting twenty five dollars an acre, but if you put a solar farm in there, you can get two hundred dollars an acre and that's to go to the state they can still fence that off and still have pasture going but it's new power and that is something that's you know you're going back to jimmy carter time now folks that was if those of you that remember there was a lot of people that put a little solar panel up on the side of their house or their garage or whatever that's and guess what runs the satellites up above we've been into that for a long time okay any any others? Back, I think we can go back to the funding too, and I'll throw my pitch in. Townships and counties have been waiting a long time, folks, to get money to fix roads and bridges. Because I was a part of that four years ago or five years ago. And you can look at Spink County, which is Redfield, Clark County, up in this area. You've got bridges that can't be road drove on anymore, and, and he can tell you that. We gotta or try to get some of that money back to the counties for that specific, and that's my opinion, but you get as you get a job like what we've had, and what, we, what she has, you'll see there's a deficit of being money coming back to the counties. Yeah, I, I think that there is some investigation into uh, the loans because there have been a lot of questions about those. And, and you know, I think in in a little bit of a defense of that process, it, ha it was brought up so quickly and trying to get the money out to people so, you know, as quickly as possible during COVID. But I... I think it's good that that information is public because a lot of people have raised questions about who got the loans and some of them were really big and some people I believe are still waiting for money. Some small businesses are still waiting for that those loan funds. Well, and I, what I saw is some of the people that 
were being helped with their small business loans, if they were being helped by a, an organization or an individual that had kind of the inside track and knew what needed to be done, it went a lot smoother where for just the average individual working on their own, it was a, it was a difficult process to manage. And, and so I, you know, it, I don't think that's okay because it gave an advantage to people that, you know, had those resources already in place. So the PPP, some of them are forgivable loans, like they'll, they're, they'll be forgiven if they meet certain criteria. Others, uh, so it then turns into a grant. Others are loans to be paid back uh, with good, you know, really uh, friendly terms. We have, we have that in a special session, Kelvin, and a part of what's that she's referring to, and I, I will agree a little bit, to get the money out. When it came to September, I think there was only about 10 or 12 percent of that money that was spoken for, and the governor and the state didn't want all that other money going back to the federal government, so let's use it up so they reduced some of the, the regulations and how you could apply for it. But I've got this, I've got, I've got those scrolls on my phone, what you're talking about, there's anywhere from three hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars that some of these companies or corporations and farmers, farmers got, whether they're a corporation or not. It's like, what did I do wrong? That I did, you know. It's like, why didn't I get some of that money? But I think it's a really, really. If I re I was on that committee, it was a very, very cheap interest rate. I'm thinking one, one and a half percent payback over. Five years, uh, unless they might have stretched that out again a little bit too. But there was some that was that was grant money, and I don't mean to there to take that away. But I, I was in the whole realm of, of doing that, and and I don't know why David either why the small cafe. That's where that should have went. It should have went back out to the country to local organizations that need help in a small town. So. Any other questions? Right, good point, good point. <laughs> I know, I know which bill you're talking about. I can't remember the number right now either, but yes, it would, it was under the guise of charitable organizations being able to make contributions and not have to say who made these contributions. And I think it's, it was Angela Kennecke from Kelloland that uh, really took that to the next level and dug into that, which it's, I, th I think it's terrific that we have journalists willing to make these uh, investigations because there's a lot of pushback against that, uh, them investigating, with, but it's so important because there are a lot of things that, and I'm sure it's always been that way, but that come through seeming rather innocent. And then, you know, some people caught on to that right away though, that this was a way for, for potentially money to come in without having any accountability for where it came from. Yeah, Senate Bill 155, as it stands right now, is um, oops, that's not right. is to uh, authorize 
construction of worth workforce housing, you know, appropriate funds for workforce housing in, but this is only in Rapid City and Sioux Falls. And as we all know, living in, whether you're in Roberts or Marshall or maybe another county nearby, uh, we have a, a tremendous housing shortage here too. And I, th I think the whole state is really uh, suffering with that, especially affordable housing. And so I've heard a lot of people talking about why, so it's $5 million for the South Dakota Housing Development Authority to use for grants for providing low interest revolving loans for developers and property owners for workforce housing projects in Sioux Falls and Rapid City, which I know obviously there are more people needing housing, we have those needs here too. So I've, he I've heard from a lot of people, just why is this not statewide? I don't know, currently there's not a, an amendment on that or anything, but it hasn't, it doesn't even have a scheduled hearing in Senate State Affairs yet. So hopefully, you know, maybe we can see some expansion of that to help all areas of our state. I've gotten that question a couple times today. So. And I got this from Lori Moan today, and that, that would be Grove, South Dakota, here in town. Uh, it's kind of recreating the wheel is what she's saying. So long story short, let's put 30 to $50 million into South Dakota Housing Opportunity Fund and increase or incorporate the language already in existence uh, and use that as a mechanism then for a revolving loan fund and so we can get that out to small communities too other than just your large, large communities. That's where that's coming from. Gary? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's a bill. I don't know. That was a Senate bill, and I'm not sure what exactly what happened to that, but Randall Messaba from Sioux Falls, I believe, Senator was uh, looking into, w wanted some accountability on the use of the plane, how much it's costing. Again, very similar to that security transparency bill. Very few people want to cross the governor and, and actually ask for any accounting of how our money is being spent. So unfortunately, and I, she, wa she wants a new plane, I believe also. Well, it's, you know, it's, you, it's so frustrating to hear, for example, an address from the governor talking about how frugal we are and spending wisely. We, we, don't, we don't have money for very many things, but then we always seem to have money for things like that, and, and that's frustrating. So that's what they're talking about, but then it seems like the money is is set aside, people forget about it, and is it, you know, funneled to different, t for different things? Yeah, Rochelle? Mental health, yeah, the, and you know, it. This is my first 
session in the legislature, but I have seen a lot of different things come through or reports from Department of Health, Department of Social Services, that kind of thing, that there does seem to be more of a focus on mental health than there has been in the past. So I think that's really important. There was one bill, this isn't necessarily related to children per se, but this talked about uh, mental health options for first responders and providing for more of a, a structured program for first responders who have gone through traumatic events and having access to different services. And it was really a no-brainer, I mean, for almost everybody on the committee, that, that that would be sent to appropriations and similar things with young people, with, with everyone, really. But, you know, if you're talking about different groups... Certainly, I think that would probably come through education, maybe if it's through schools, but um, I think that's important. Yeah, I mean, like, it doesn't exist. Um, children, elementary school children, middle school children, there is nowhere to go if you have a mental health problem. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I Mm -hmm. Leanne, do you know the facility, the new facility out at IHS, is that not going to handle some mental health stuff in there? Did I read that somewhere? Do you know, is that part of the new building going up at the clinic? It seemed to me there was going to be some mental health uh, stuff in there too for, for natives, but Back to the question, that started a year ago when I was there that we need to focus more on mental health because we're not doing the job of covering that. You can't slide it off anymore and, and forget about it. That, that, that's really common. Yeah. The other thing I'm going to mention it a little bit uh, for Kelvin and, and I think probably for Jennifer, which I found out yesterday, I've been working quite a bit on C.G. Hollow State Park, trying to get that updated, re improved, refurbished a little bit. Um, and Mike, uh, those of you who remember, I had a meeting at the Nicollet Tower out here last summer, four or five departments that came. My question to the, to the tourism secretary was, you put millions of dollars into the Palisades State Park down there, but what have you done here lately? And those of you who know who that secretary is, it's Jim Hagan. He was born and raised here, so I had a real close eye-to-eye -eye, one -on one-on-one with him. And he just looked at me and said, you're right, we haven't. So we did a tour up there uh, last fall. Dennis came along, Dennis and I went up there once, and we all went up there at one point. I did hear yesterday that there's a $50,000, whether it's grant, but we are getting some money to refurbish that a little bit more. And he did tell, Willie told me, he's the regional parks person out of Parktown. When we were up there the first part of July, C.G. Hollow had already met its attendance the first part of July for the whole year prior to that. By the time they closed in October, the attendance was up 400%. When the, when the colors were just absolutely phenomenal, you couldn't hardly find a place to drive or park. That, that's the benefits of that park. And I think now we've really made some inside, you know, movement there where we can get a little bit more. Uh, they're going to do a little bit up on top. If there's anybody that's familiar with that, they're going to try and put in some solar lighting up there on a couple uh, places to park RVs type of a thing. Gravel road. The one thing that always came up from people is we don't have real accessible water there. And so that's something that we're going to look at. But that for this area, that's huge. Because the more people that go there, chances are they're going to either stop in Sicily or Britain to stay, to drink, to eat, to, to whatever, and that's sales tax dollars for the community. What else? Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Gary. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, one thing I would add... I think just about everybody lives 
you know, in this, I think, does everybody live in this district? I think I know everyone, right? So we're all district one. If there are, so I, I think that we have a good group of the three of us that are representing this district currently, fairly um, sensible on most things. There are several people in the legislature that are, are very extreme. So if there are issues that you feel strongly about and but you're confident that your representatives are representing your ideas, but you have friends, family, acquaintances in other parts of the state, especially on things you feel strongly about, please reach out to them to contact their legislators because I think a lot of people, I, I just talked to somebody today that I know that lives down um, in the western part of Sioux Falls that was really upset about something. And I said, do you know who your representatives are? And she said, oh, I, I have no idea. Let me check. And I don't, I don't know who her representatives are yet. She hasn't gotten back to me. But I think that's really important is that sometimes people get, you know, they're bothered by something, but they don't reach out to those representatives because we've got some extreme ideas uh, going on in our legislature right now and it's frustrating for everyone but I think in some ways it's almost more frustrating when and I, I found this as a constituent when I had good representatives who were voting you know looking at voting records voting how I would like them to vote but it's still not things in the legislature are not happening completely how you would want them to happen and I think just a lot of times people are not paying attention state politics are not as exciting as what's happening on the national level it's easy to just think there's not much that can be done but I think a lot of these people can be swayed the numbers that I've heard is in the house there's about 20 to 25 real extreme ones and probably about 20 to 25 moderate and then a couple wild cards in the middle this is on the republican side i mean obviously people on the um, democrats can be you know extremists too we, we don't have that in particular at the moment my in my view but it's just something to keep in mind because sometimes people are really shocked at what they see um, how people are voting on certain things i don't know if anybody of any of you heard about this um seemed like a no-brainer bill uh, this last week. I thought it would be similar to the visually impaired bill that I was telling you about that everybody voted for. Uh, but this particular one was to add dental hygienists to the list of mandatory reporters for child abuse. And there are several people on that list. Uh, teachers, I think doctors, um, I think dentists are on it, chiropractors. You know, anybody that comes into contact with children and might see signs of abuse. And dental hygienists asked to be added to that, the dental hygienist organization. And 18 people out of 70 voted against that on the House floor. They, they didn't think that anybody should be mandated to report child abuse. And it was, it was a shocking moment. It was, I mean, <laughs> it was a shocking moment, let me tell you, uh, that, that there are 18 people in our state legislature who don't think that anybody should be required to report child abuse if they see it. And a lot of you probably already know how this works. This was uh, new information for me. But if you are one of these mandatory reporters and you report something that doesn't turn out to be true, like maybe you have a suspicion, but they investigate, you're protected. But the average person, like if I just said, I think that this child was being abused, they could come back on me and potentially sue me. So that's why it's so important to have these mandatory reporters because they're protected. And so then they're, they feel more safe doing the right thing and making that, um, you know, making that claim and to do so anonymously. So, um, yeah, it was just, it's really important to think outside of just our district if you have friends and family in other parts of the state, because not everything is, not all parts of the state are as, uh, you know, I think we're pretty sensible and well balanced up here in Northeast South Dakota, but some people are being represented uh, by a, a lot more of an extreme element that's, that's not what, I don't think that in most cases that's what their district is asking for. So that would just be my final 
thought on that. Are there any other questions or comments? I appreciate, oh, do you have something? No, okay, I appreciate Representative McCleary moderating and uh, assistant courier for live streaming, the chamber for hosting, and Rosalie's here, and for all of you coming. I appreciate it. And another thing is just reach out to me at any time. My email address is right there on the website, uh, my phone number, and um, I'm always glad to hear from you. So, thanks. This, this, was, uh, this was a 2018 piece. Uh, I mean, he's such a crack guy. Nielsen, come on, come on. We'll, we'll represent him. So, so it's, yeah. It's a little over, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I can show you some of the properties. It, it's been, that and Shun's been a document to the community. This live stream was brought to you by Dakota Pond and Thrift. For all your pond needs, Countryside Inn, Assisted Living, and Memory Care in Rossalt, where your family is our family, First Savings Bank of Sisseton, use our online banking to save you time, Stilson Service in Sisseton with Marathon Fuels, Tri-State Water in Sisseton for all your water needs, water softeners and reverse osmosis right here in Sisseton. And, of course, the Sisseton Courier, where we do more than the weekly newspaper. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.